Hello, everybody. Uh, we want to start the tools and technique sponsored by Abbott. Our, we have three distinct guest topics to discuss. The first one is to understand that bulb design may impact long-term durability. Second, to understand how to mitigate the risk of paravalvular leakage. And the last, to understand the importance of the possibility for coronary access after TABI. These three topics are the most important topics in matured TABI procedures. So let's start our, by uh, Dr. Moriyama. And uh, we have uh, distinguished uh, moderators. Of course, everybody knows uh, Dr. Sondergaard. And also, we have uh, discussants, Masanori Yamamoto. And uh, as a speaker, we have uh, Noriaki Moriyama and Kentaro Hayashida and Michael Lee. Okay, please. Thank you, Dr. Saito. My name is uh, Noriaki Moriyama. So uh, I would like to show my, our first case. So this is a patient background. So this is my COI. So our first patient is a 78 years old male. Her height is 160 centimeter and weight is 47 kilogram. And he was uh, living with uh, mild frailty. And uh, in this uh, time, a uh, patient uh, was admitted by a decompensated heart failure with uh, NYJ class 4. Uh, he made a margin to admission to treat heart failure. And uh, notably, a uh, patient had a uh, uh, past medical history, and he received a mechanical mitral valve replacement due to severe mitral regurgitation uh, 13 years ago. And also, he had a chronic kidney disease and atrial fibrillation and mild anemia. And this is a laboratory investigation. As you can see, the patient has a mild anemia. Hemoglobin level is 11, and the creatinine level is slight, uh, increasing. And surprisingly, a BNP level is over 7,000. And the EKG shows a chronic atrial fibrillation with a narrow QLOS. As you can see, the echo data, our LBEF is significantly decreased, 28%, due to impaired LV function, stroke volume index is also 26, and peak aortic velocity is 3.7, and the EOA index is smaller than 0.6. It means the patient has a, a low flow, low gradient, severe aortic stenosis patient. And also, you can see a, a mechanical mitral valve uh, uh, previously uh, implanted uh, in the mitral position. And uh, you can see a CT data. Uh, as you can see, a patient has a, a, a severely calcified tricuspid aortic valve uh, stenosis. And uh, also our distance from our aorta to mitral position is uh, 5.4 millimeter, and the annulus perimeter is 78, and the minimum diameter of the annulus is 18 millimeter. And the uh, sinus of Barsalba is wide enough, and also STJ is 27 millimeter, <coughs> and the coronary height is sufficient to put the uh, tabby valve. And uh, you can see the uh, femoral access. Uh, femoral access is uh, quite big uh, for tower access, but uh, you can see uh, uh, moderate uh, totality in the external iliac artery. In some lights for this patient, a uh, patient is uh, 78 years old male or with a STS score uh, 12, or more than 12 or with an impaired LB function. And the uh, patient doesn't have uh, any coronary artery disease, but uh, he had a severe calcified aortic valve, uh, and the uh, mechanical mitral valve was uh, placed at the mitral position. And also, the patient had a moderately tortuous femoral artery. Thank you for attention. 
So, uh, I mean, I would say this is look like a potential challenging case. Um, patients have severe aortic valve calcification. We know that will increase the risk of uh, paravalvar leak after a type of procedure. And um, maybe particularly in a patient with impaired LV function, uh, ejection fr fraction was down to 28%. Kentaro, what, would, would you have concern about uh, PVL in this patient and, and also the outcome? And, See, I had one slide here, a little bit old slide from, from one of the partner trials, but maybe you can explain uh, who are the risk for PVL after a TARP procedure and what is the potential impact on, on having a par valve leak after TARP? Thank you very much, Leif. Actually, the, if the patient has really excessive calcification, we, we may have some risk of the PVL after procedure, especially if the patient has LV OT calcification, there's a huge risk for the PVL. And for the patient uh, that the Dr. Mariam demonstrated, of course, the, uh, we can find the severe heavy calcification on the leaflet, but the, it's still doable. And for the mild uh, PBL, I have published the data when I was in France, and the mild PBL impacts the uh, prognosis after procedure. But nowadays, the, we are treating much younger and lower risk patient. And our ocean uh, registry demonstrated data that the mild PBL doesn't impact mortality, but impact the uh, readmission by her failure. So, so, so certainly that's something we should avoid because it's going to impact the survival of clinic outcome for the patient. Michael, um, some people say if I've got a patient with severe aortic uh, calcification, I wouldn't choose all platform. I would choose a platform which got a high radial force. Uh, is, is that the case? And while you start to explain it, I will just move down and, and make a small cartoon uh, and we, we can continue the discussion about the force. Right, Lars. Um, uh, we, we, we used to think that we probably need a, a, a very strong radial force to uh, uh, safeguard the scaffold the calcium, but uh, in reality, uh, uh, even the self-expanding device got a, a strong enough radial force to actually uh, um, secure the um, the opening of the annulus so that we will have a very satisfactory EOA at the end of the procedure. So you don't really need a very, very strong radial force. We know, uh, like, I don't know whether you know about the Chinese valve, the venous A got a very strong radial force. But we don't really need that sort of radial force to safeguard a very satisfactory EOA, even if it is very calcified. Because I think there's some confusion about uh, what, what people mean when they talk about force. Maybe we can have the smart screen up so we can see it. So, so let's say this is the diameter of a valve coming down from 27 millimeter. It's crimped down to five millimeter within the delivery system. And the force will build up. So, so what actually happens when you have your valve here on the table before you start to, to crimp it? It will have zero force. As you start to crimp it, the force is going to build up. It's going to be higher and higher when it's sitting inside the delivery system when you start to deploy it. And then when the valve is coming out, it's going to take a different curve down here until it actually meets the aortic annulus. So let's see if we can do it once again here, up and down. So this is actually what we call the radial force. This is the force which the valve applied to the aortic annulus when it's fully expanded. Uh, but when, and that force is actually almost the same for all valves, all self-expanding valve, balloon expanding valve. That's not, not a lot of difference in the, in the radial force. What the difference is, is this force up here. You can call that the opening force of the stent frame, of the expansion force, and that's going to be different from some valves. So let's say we have another valve here. Uh, you can use the red color. It's going to come up in a similar way, but it's going to hit up a little bit higher here and come down here as you de uh, deploy it. And you see the radial force is the same, but there's a different in the opening force. So what is the trade-off of having a higher opening force or lower opening force? If you have a higher opening force, you need less pre-dilatation before you actually implant the valve, but you're also going to have a less flexible system. 
And I'm just going to, to illustrate it here uh, in, in one case uh, I had a few years back. Um, if you can get the slide back on, please. So this was a patient who had a quite acute angulation of the aortic arch. I didn't pay too much attention myself uh, to the CT scan prior to the procedure, so I just took the patient to the cat lab and choose a system with a higher opening force, a system where you need less predilatation, but it comes on a cost that you're going to have a less flexible system. The system is going to be much more stiff. So when I actually tried to, to advance it up, the patient was treated in local anesthesia and she complained about back pain. And I pulled my pigtail back and you can see I managed to perforate uh, the aorta. So we're the same team doing a TIVA procedure, so we quickly measured the CT scan, still with the patient fully awake, put a TIVA graft in, and changed, in this case here, to a portico system or a navigator system, which have a little bit lower opening force, but you can see it's a much more flexible system. So just back to this discussion, if I had got a patient with severe calcification with the risk of parvalvar leak, it doesn't make sense to talk about radial force because that's the same across all platform. If you have a lower opening force, you need to do more pre-dilatation, but you can also see here, you're going to have a system which is much more flexible. So I don't know what your practice is in, uh, for, for a mass, uh, for patient like this, so if you have any concerns about patient with severe calcification of, of the aortic annulus. Yeah, uh, uh, in my practice, yeah, in case of the severe calcification, you always choose the self-expandable valve. But uh, I know uh, I'm really interested in this concept. I understand uh, what you mean. So the difference between the uh, intraannular design and the supraannular design does not have an impact of the parabolic leak, you think. So, and uh, anyway, it, uh, in this situation, or uh, it is the, the presented by Moriyama case, I would like to choose a self expandable valve. Okay. Mm. Mm. So, so again here, I mean, uh, we have seen now, uh, as I said, this is uh, with, uh, with also the portico, but we have seen also iteration of, of valve designs and uh, from going from the portico valve to the navigator valve with this uh, ceiling skirt. Uh, maybe you, Noriaki, can, can comment that. Uh, this was uh, the data. There was first 120 patients treated with this valve, which was used for the c marked uh, So maybe you can comment on, on, on the outcome here with this valve. Okay, and uh, in my experience, so navigator navicel or so-called navicel is uh, quite better to mitigating the PBL, and uh, this is the uh, uh, data uh, from a CMARC study, and uh, as you can see, uh, no uh, moderate or severe PBL is uh, was observed, and the mild PBL is just a uh, 20%, and uh, almost. All patients have uh, no trace PBL. It is uh, clearly a beautiful result uh, to show the impact of the nerve cell, I think. Yeah. And I also think it's, it's fair to say with most of these new generation valves with this external shield skirt, a parvalvar leak is not the same issue as it used to be. Uh, and, at, and again, as I said before, talking about radial force doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it's, it's the opening force which is different, and you can compensate by, by doing a pre dilatation. On the other hand, low opening force is going to give you a much more flexible system if you have tortuous anatomy. And also notice the case you just presented had quite tortuous access vessels. So, so why don't you just show us how you actually treated this patient and, and what the outcome was? And you can say, we, we used to say, you saw the slide before, we won't see more than mild PVL, but I think even when we're moving to younger patients, people are saying we don't even want to see mild PVL. The, the target is to have non-only trace PVL, so, so we're more ambitious than we used to be. So our, this is our treatment strategy for this patient. So our, uh, we treated this patient uh, under constant sedation, and uh, we select a uh, light uh, femoral access uh, practically, and uh, we use our, our cephalic mold uh, for our AV wire, and uh, we choose our 80 millimeter uh, balloon uh, dilatation uh, before uh, ta uh, tabby valve deployment uh, based on the CT measurement. And also, we selected a uh, Navitor 27 millimeter valve.
So our, in my institute, so echo guide puncture is mandatory uh, to mitigating the major vascular complication. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our operator is actually uh, Dr. Saito. Uh, Dr. Saito uh, did uh, echo guide puncture very well, and uh, we use uh, only one uh, flat close stitch for uh, tower access. Mm. And uh, eight French sheets is inserted uh, via light transfer lower access. Yeah. Yeah. As you probably see the CT data, uh, CT data, femoral access was a bit uh, tortuous, so we kept a uh, uh, long large focus wire to exchange a uh, large focus to stiff wire. So, so what size sheet are you introducing now? So, are we chose a uh, 14 French dry uh, seal for the BAB. So, the valve system which you're going to in introduce in a second is comparable with the 14 French sheet. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you usually use integrated sheets? Ah, uh, sure. So, almost. Uh, uh, 60% cases we use the integrated seas, and also uh, we tend to use Navitor for a very tortuous anatomy and the calcified air access. So uh, sometimes uh, we use a, uh, a 14 flange uh, dry seal or AEC to do uh, BAV. And we ordinarily use straight a large focus wire to close the out valve and uh, amplify uh, one catheter uh, was introduced to left ventricle. Do you uh, do, do you always put in a temporary pacing wire? Uh, or using the LV yes, pacing? in my institute uh, we use a temporary pacing wire uh, from the left groin. Where are you uh, I always use LB pacing. Ah, LB pacing. Uh, even for balloon expandable, yeah. Mm. So, so Michael, maybe for people who's not uh, used to, to to these procedures, what's what's the difference between LB pacing and RV pacing? Can you just explain it? In yeah, traditionally we were taught to put in the temporary pacing wire. You can either go from the femoral or you can go from the jugular vein, so that uh, you will have a temporary pacing wire inside. But uh, actually. Um, from our experience and from experience, initial experience in France, actually uh, you, you pay through the uh, stiff wire that you use to implant your tapi device, and then another end of the pacing over the skin, or, or for us, we, we sometimes do it over the uh, 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 coronary guide wire through the sentinel device, then actually you can uh, uh, also uh, have a very effective pacing. Mm. Uh, instead of going in with a temporary pacing wire and we save the possible complication of LV perforation. Mm. So last may I explain the LV pacing in Japanese? Safari wire in the Nkyoko Tsukeru to Sure de Pacing ga dekki cha to go to the next one. I'm not sure if you can see the wire. I'm not sure if you can see the wire. I'm not sure if you can see the wire. I'm not sure if so here you see, you, as you said, you, you're going to do a pre-dilatation again. This is uh, 18. Yeah, to, to compensate for the lower expansion or opening force. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, you, you're going to have a much more flexible system. So, um, Dr. Saito, any concern with if you do a target procedure in a patient with a pre-existing mechanical mitre valve? Are yes. you doing anything different in those cases? Yes, of course. Uh, sometimes the uh, target valve. The, the lower end of, of the tabi valve will interfere with the uh, mitral valve mm -hmm. prosthesis. So we have to first measure by CT, measure the distance. The distance, yeah. 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 
And now our Napter delivery system uh, was introduced. It will be light glowing. Uh, it looks very smooth, uh, all thanks to our uh, hydrophilic coating, a uh, low profile or delivery system. And you see and also how flexible it is. It will yeah. take even very tortuous anatomy. Mm. So hydrophilic coating is quite great, and uh, we virtually don't feel any resistance mm. for most cases. And uh, as you discussed about the uh, uh, mechanical mitral valve, so we selected a uh, caspo valve view uh, to see the uh, depths of uh, out, uh, uh, transcacity head valve. In my opinion, if a patient has a mechanical mitral valve leaflet, uh, we should uh, use a caspopolar view uh, always. And then, uh, after a deployment of the valve, so we need to check the interference of the out valve and the mitral valve. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Do, do, during this process, did you do the control pacing? Uh, ordinarily, we never uh, use control pacing uh, during uh, NAPTA deployment. Mm. So, so, Michael, why don't you need pacing with this valve compared to the Evolute valve? Uh, uh, we, we usually would not do pacing when we deploy this valve because this valve is very stable and you don't see the drop in blood pressure uh, usually. So, um, uh, unless there are lots of aortic regurgitation, then probably we will pay 120. Mm -hmm. As you can see, uh, there's no interference uh, between the uh, mechanical mitral valve and the navigator. So, uh, we decided uh, to put the uh, uh, navigator valve this position because uh, we don't have any interference and also uh, there's no conduction disturbance. So, uh, and uh, also our PBL is uh, quite minimal, so uh, we decide to put the uh, valve at this position. Yeah. But, and, but you had the option if you want to recapture and reposition, mm. so it's, uh, but this looked to me as a very nice position, high position and, and no interference with the prosthesis. So, Dr. Saito, so uh, which depth is a target of your implantation? Which three depth? millimeter. What? Three millimeter. How deep would you like to implant? Yeah, I I always adjust the marker, distal marker, at the center of the pigtail, and then start. And of course, I'm adjusting the depths yeah. while uh, deploying the uh, valve. Maybe and three. Also, for this particular case, uh, I'm pushing oh, and. Uh, uh, pushing the system because uh, I understood that the uh, we did not get a good actuality for this case. So I'm, I, I, I pushed the system a little bit and then turned the uh, shaft to the outer curvature. So maybe you could just comment on what we see on, uh, on the echocardiography here. Yeah. And as you can see, our, our echocardiography uh, shows no or PBL uh, after navity valve deployment, and uh, there is no interference uh, between the out valve, uh, navity valve, and the uh, mechanical or mitral valve. Uh. And also, uh, we did a uh, catheter hemodynamic assessment, and the uh, pressure gradient is a single digit. I think uh, this is a uh, this was a very good result with the Navigator 27. It looks to me like a, a great outcome. And uh, with the Navigator, so uh, in, as you know, the patient has a very impaired uh, left ventricular function. We didn't do any patient during deployment, and uh, all thanks to intraannual design, uh, hemodynamic uh, is uh, uh, quite stable even during the navigator valve deployment. And this is the final shot. Yeah. I don't see any PVL. Yeah. Yeah. And no post dilatation here. And no post dilate. So, so thanks a lot, uh, Noraki. So, so Kentaro, know you also have. Um, Experience with the with the navigator valve. So, so can you 
tell us what, what is your impression? We saw the data from the CMARC trial, but what is uh, your so far real world experience in Japan with this valve? Actually, the, uh, my first impression is really good valve. The, uh, the most impressed uh, part of the device was the, uh, the crossability. And uh, if the patient has very pretty frame access, uh, the hydrophilic coating is quite good, and we can easily negotiate with the poor reframe access. That was, uh, I'm very much impressed. And the hemodynamic performance for the uh, patient with small annulus could also be very nice. And uh, we don't have the, that much significant p pressure gradient, even for the patient with small annulus. That was also very impressive to me. Mm. And Dr. Saito, uh, Professor, I know you also one of the maybe the site in Japan which have used this valve uh, most. Uh, so, so can you tell us where does it fit into your TAVI program? Uh, of course, uh, this is a new coming uh, valve in Japan. So the, I, want to, I want to try every case. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the, I'm using a lot, yeah. this valve. And my impression is, uh, of course, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, PBL, uh, this is a good valve. And also, the, my most comfortable situation is I don't need any pacing, control pacing during deployment. And also, uh, not only uh, during deployment, but just also at the deployment, mm -hmm. we don't need. Yeah. That's the most um, good aspect for me. And I think that's because, as we discussed before, the leaflets are in an inside leaflet position. It, mm. it works immediately, so you yeah. don't need to paste during that middle phase yeah. as with, let's say, with the Evolute valve. And, and we know with self-expanding technology, if you, if you pace and you go fast on the wheel, you tend to, to lose a little bit of control on where, how deep it is, and it, it may dive down. So you can break at any point here and, and assess, reassess, and, and continue slowly up. So, mm. so I think that's, um, that's great. I think that was uh, a. Yeah. Uh, we also use it for really sick patients with greatly impaired LV function. Mm. Because in that sort of patients, we don't really want to pace. Mm. We don't want to uh, yeah. really want to lose it's the pressure. It's a very important aspect. So yeah. we want to st a stable uh, device that can be deployed without pacing. So that's the time that we would prefer the Nevertol rather than other valves. Yeah. <laughs> So let's, we have three cases lined up here with different topics. I think it's all contemporary topics when people are talking about lifetime management of, of patients with aortic stenosis. And uh, Kentaro, you're going to show the next one. It's, it's a patient, uh, as I said here, patient with small aortic annulus and thereby also a risk for, for patient prestige mismatch. Okay, thank you very much, Lars. And today I'm going to show the case with really small annulus and the uh, risk of the prosthesis patient mismatch. In the case is the uh, 83 years old female uh, with symptomatic severe aortic stenosis and the peak flow velocity uh, was 4.0 and uh, she also had a mean pressure gradient of 36. And LV ejection fraction was preserved and uh, she has the uh, small annulus with the area of 280 and the perimeter was 60. And she also had the small ST junction uh, 21 or 23. And LVOD, uh, annulus, uh, LVOD area was 240 and quite small and tapered. She also had the uh, sinus of uh, Saba with the uh, width of 24 to 26. And the height of the right coronary artery is 10, and the left coronary artery was uh, almost 15. And she has a really uh, good idiofemoral access. We can see some calcification in the femoral artery, but it should be okay. And the right femoral artery seems to be better than left uh, femoral artery. And we decided to treat the patient uh, with Navidabab, 23 millimeter bab. And firstly, uh, we performed predilatation with 16 millimeter Z-med balloon, followed by the implantation of a nebular 23 millimeter valve. That is our uh, procedural plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kentaro. So if I get, uh, get this, my slide up again, and I can maybe ask you, Michael, to, to explain for the audience, because this patient position mismatch is something a little bit new, because uh, 
If you go a few years back, certain said that this is not an issue, it's not going to impact uh, the outcome for the patient, but um, um, so can, can we just get the, the next slide up, my slide up, and maybe you can just explain what is patient prestigious mismatch and um, how do we measure it and, and what is the threshold for, for this? Right. Uh, 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 for me, um, if a patient is uh, small built or with very small annulus, if we have to use a very small valve, either a surgical valve or a Tafi device, and the end up uh, gradient across the valve is too high, then I would probably consider it as a patient prosthesis mismatch. For me, any gradient more than 10 would be not favorable. So I would try to lower it down to as much as possible as a single digit gradient at the end of the procedure. Otherwise, these sort of patients will come back if they have PPM, they will come back with a faster degeneration of the valve and that will have a lot of uh, symptoms uh, much earlier on than other patients. Yeah. So again, it's, as you said, it's, it's the valve is, is simply too small for the patient. Uh, and uh, the way you can measure it is after the procedure, often at 30 days, you measure what is the opening area, the effective orifice area of, of the biprosthetic valve, and you divide with the patient's body surface area. And I think these are the, the criteria we use to talk about it. So if you have less than 0.65 square centimeter per square meter, patient have severe patient position mismatch. If it's more than 0.85, it's insignificant. And in between 0.65 and 0.85 is a moderate PVM. And as I said, if you go a few years back, surgeons would say this is not going to impact uh, the outcome for the patient. It's also a little bit of in the concept in, uh, in, uh, in the TAVI world. But I think we have seen now consistent data on it's not true. Th these are surgical valves, but it's a meta-analysis you can see here. If the patient will have a patient position mismatch, it's going to double the risk that you have early valve failure. And it's not only about durability of these valves. It's all about the patient outcome. So if you have a moderate PPM, the patient's risk for cardiac mortality is increased with about 30%. And if you have severe PPM, you have a six-fold increase in, in cardiac mortality. Mm. So I think it's, it's really important when we have patients in front of us where we suspect uh, that could be a risk for PPM, we really think twice how to handle these patients. Um, Masa, how, how do you identify these patients uh, who mm. are at risk for, for PPM yeah. in your institution? Yeah, I'm really interested in this case uh, using the Navita valve because uh, uh, body surface area 1.57 is relatively larger in our cohort. It's such kind of small lady, but a little bit obese. So the very high BSA is associated with increased risk of the PPM after procedure. So. In my daily practice, I would like to use a supranial design, but I would like to know the result of this patient using intranial design. Yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, if we, uh, based on the concept to prevent the PPM, I think not only the annulus area, but also the body surface area is also important. So we should pay attention for the, uh, such kind of patient. <laughs> So, Nurak, this patient was 83 years of age, as, as we recall. Let's say the patient has been younger. Let's say the patient has been 73 years of mm. age. And surgery may be an option as well for this patient. Mm. Uh, do surgeons in Japan identify these patients before they take them to the OR, patients who are at risk for PPM? Uh, yes. Actually, uh, uh, the impact of PPM is uh, less known uh, uh, by cardiac surgeon in my hospital. So we need to discuss about the impact of PPM uh, between cardiac uh, interventionalist and the cardiac surgeon. And uh, sometimes uh, we, uh, we found uh, this kind of uh, younger patient in Japan. So our, Mm, in uh, last year, so I recommend the uh, cardiac surgeon to enlarge uh, aortic annulus to put the uh, uh, big uh, surgical aortic valve. But uh, it is a uh, uh, quite rare uh, operation in Japan still. So uh, um, after the discussion, uh, we put the uh, um, self-expanding transcalcitate heart valve to mitigating the uh, PPM. Yeah. 
Yeah. But that's exactly as you said, this is one option if the patient is going for surgery to ask the surgeons to do what we call root enlargement. So he transects uh, the aortic annulus and put a patch in and thereby can get a bigger surgical valve prosthesis in and a lower risk of PPM. The problem is just that most surgical sites will not use it. And also, if you don't have recognized it up front, you don't know it's a small aortic annulus, patients, or the surgeons may not be prepared for it. So I don't know what it is in Japan, but at least what we do in our institution nowadays, you see here when the patients are, no matter what age, if the patient is referred with severe aortic stenosis, all patients <coughs> have a CT scan before the heart team discussion. Thereby, you know what is the size of the aortic annulus and what is the risk of PPM, particularly if the patient will go for surgery, because if you don't do it before, it's unlikely to be done afterwards. I don't know, is that also the, the, the practice in, in, in Hong Kong, Michael? Uh, well, our surgeons would like us to do CT scans, but uh, <laughs> because of the uh, financial issues, it's seldom uh, being done uh, for our surgical patients. Mm. It's, uh, we will be done for patients going for TAFI procedure, but I agree that if we can do a CT even before surgical AVR, that would help our surgeons a lot. That will help the outcome of our patients. Mm. so that we can predict what kind of patient will require root enlargement. Mm. So we also discussed if, if the surgeons will not do root enlargement, this, uh, maybe the patient is better off uh, with a TARI procedure. But Kentaro, we also discussed earlier today, these valves are, are not the same. Maybe you can just explain uh, on, on the different valve design and, and how it potentially can impact uh, hemodynamic performance and risk of PPM. Yep. Actually, the inhibitor valve has a straight design. Uh, this slide says the cylindrical valve. And ablate was a little bit tapered, and sepin is the interannual design, a little bit tapered. And this kind of the difference in design could uh, impact the hemodynamic uh, uh, performance. Yeah. And I think we have seen, at least, that we have seen uh, data from, uh, from, from the US. This was a portico IDE trial where patients was randomized between the portico valve, which is now the Navitor valve, or the two commercial valves available in, in the US, the Evolute valve and the Sapien valve. And if you just look at the patient cohort uh, who are particularly at risk of PPM, patients with small aortic annulus, which was defined as a diameter of 23 or less, you can see here it's clearly coming out with different rate of, of PPM. So if you choose a balloon expandable valve, it's about one out of four patients who will come out of the cat lab with severe PPM, 40% on top of that will have moderate PPM. Otherwise, if you choose a balloon, a self-expanding technology, it's a much lower rate. It's about 3% who will have PPM, severe PPM, and about 25% who have uh, moderate. And also maybe very important here, you can see there's no difference between self-expanding technology with an intra leaflet position or super leaflet position. And I think it all comes back to the valve design, which Kentaro just explained, mm. how the leaflet can actually open up. So I think also when, if you choose to do TAV in these patients, it will also make a different what kind of platform you actually choose for the, for the, uh, for the patient. So, so Masa, uh, this patient is 83 years of age and um, I don't know what life expectancy, but again, we have seen a, at least some part of the world, uh, TAV has moved down to much younger patients. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a report from last year in the US that patient younger than 65 years of age with severe aortic stenosis, isolated aortic stenosis, half of these patients are nowadays off a TAVI procedure. Oh, really? So we also need to, to think about the next step uh, when these uh, transcatheter heart valves are failing and, and what is the issues about uh, doing a TAVI and TAVI in these mm -hmm. procedures, uh, patients coming back with a failed TAVI valve? Yeah, we have a lot of caution uh, considering the TAVI and TAVI procedure. First of all, it's, uh, uh, it's re re the pr procedural difficulty at first. And second one is uh, some uh, uh, plaque or uh, aortic calcium inside the bioprocesses. So we should use uh, and pay attention for the, uh, to reduce the risk of embolization during the procedure. And lastly, we should uh, manage the future coronary access to maintain uh, the uh, coronary route. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Mm. And I think particularly coronary access is something everyone is concerned about, and, and you need to plan that up front before the first valve is going in. 
And you can see this is just one mm. of some of the things you have to consider. Let's say you're going to use a balloon expandable valve in a failed transcatheter heart valve. You need to look at what is the height of the new skirt going to be. The higher the new skirt is going to be, the more difficult it will be to come into the coronary arteries. Mm. Some of the leaflet may overhang from the first valve, overhang the second valve. You have this leaflet overhang, which can also impact the hemodynamic performance after a type in type procedure. And then, of course, also it makes it different. How big are these stent cells? Uh, can you access the coronary arteries? Is it very small? Are they large or are they none? So again, I think if you want to talk about uh, TAVI in these uh, younger patients, uh, talking about lifetime management, we need to think really careful before we make the decision on the first valve. Should it be a surgical valve? Should it be a transcatheter heart valve? If you want to go for TAVI, which platform is best to have a good durability? avoid patient prestige match match, but also which valve is at the same time also well suited for uh, TAVI and TAVA uh, later on uh, without jeopardizing the access to the coronary arteries. So Kentaro, maybe you can show us uh, how this procedure actually went. Oh. So uh, we approach from the uh, right femoral artery and we insert the uh, uh, drag seal. And we usually use JR catheter with the album 035 wire for better control of the catheter. And uh, we cross the valve and uh, <clears throat> we're going to put the safari wire through the JR catheter. And uh, we, once you switch to the pictic catheter, and uh, we put the safari wire for this case. And we usually confirm the position of the safari wire by echo. And uh, we always perform very good predilatation for the bitter expansion of navular valve. Hmm. And we always use the uh, integrated sheets for better uh, interferon access. The hydrophilic coating of the device is really great, and uh, we usually don't feel any resistance when we advance the system. で、あの、コミシャルエムティやはりナビタでも重要ですので、ま、このようにその、ポートが30方向にあるということが重要ですね。それではデバイス上げていきたいと思います。で、このナビタの特徴としては非常にこのフレキシビリティ高いと硬く
いいですねめっちゃゆっくり開けていただいてはい、と、ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。ありがとうで現在あの大体5ミリぐらいの深さですけれどもただあのもともとお客もないのとですねこのブロックも特に生じていないとで先客のみが生じている状態ですねで多分少しあの石灰が少ないのであの上に上がるんじゃないかなということを予測してまあこうにしようかなと思いますけどで重要なのはですねあのワイヤーをしっかり引くことですねあの限界まで引くこと、うん、でちょっと待ってね。So, the target depth is usually、uh, between 3 to 5 inner center. And we don't take any risk for the embolization. Unfortunately, we have never experienced the embolization with this device. And for e b l u t e we usually leave the pictic a c i d in non coronary cusp. But for this device,、uh, we just remove the pictic catheter just before releasing the valve. And we usually deploy the bat much slower than、uh, e v l u t e to avoid the、uh, upward motion of the device. <coughs> And we usually not to push the、uh, or pull at this moment to avoid the.、Uh, So, sometimes the inhibitor is difficult to detach. But as far as you don't push or pull at this moment, so it should be okay.、Mm. Mm. Yeah, we always、uh, open really slow. You can take time. And please note that the,、uh, the tab, the number of tabs are three, not two. There's a difference between a i r b l u t e and n a v i g a t o r We need to confirm that the, all the tabs are、uh, free using the、uh, multiple projection. We also need to be careful with the nose cone, not to embolize the bag. こちらの方のノーコン収納するということでこちらのボタンを押しながら引きますその時ワイヤー抜けないようにワイヤーを押していただくとじゃあ行きますはいこんな感じですねはいじゃあ全体にはいじゃあ行きますね
でこの通りですね非常に表彰便利の方でエリアが280ぐらいなおかつペリメーター61ぐらいの方で,であの非常に結構オビースが強くてですね BSM1.5 を超えてるんですけれども、まあ、その中で非常にこのシビア PPM が懸念されるところですけれども、まあ、ご覧のようにですねこの平均圧迫度もかなり低く抑えられていますのであの非常に良い血行動態が示せているんではないかなと思います。So、actually, he explained everything, but、uh, we have really nice mean pressure gradient, even though the patient is quite obese. Almost no PBL. And the groin is okay.、Mm. Thank you very much. And so that was a great demonstration,、uh, one more very smooth implantation. And、um, uh, we have seen now two cases where、um, uh, both operators took the time to deploy the valve. There was no rush、uh, during it. Maybe you can just try to highlight,、uh, because people are often saying this is just another self expanding technology. What, what is the difference between this platform and an Evolute platform when you,、uh, for the steps you're doing uh, during a、uh, valve deployment? Okay, this is my private opinion. And for e v e l i t we start from the higher position and then we push the device forward to avoid the migration. On the other hand, so,、uh, I usually try to open up the lower part of the navigable inside of the left ventricle to avoid non uniform expansion,、uh, which may lead to the、uh, migration of the valve. And then we、uh, gently pull back the device. And adjust the position, and then we open up really slowly. As far as、uh, we can do that,、uh, we can have a non uniform expansion and、uh, we don't experience any migration of the valve. That is、uh, the major difference between two devices. This is my opinion. Yeah. Mike, we, we discussed、uh, on the first case also about flexibility of, of the valve and,、um, and about the stiffness of the capsule. This valve is also quite good if you have chancing anatomy such as、uh, horizontal or auto. Maybe you can just explain again what's the difference between a stiff delivery system and, and a very flexible one, as you see here. Right, with this device, the flex depth、uh, system is really, really uh, um, good in the negotiating all the tortuosities of the descending all the way up to the ascending aorta and then cross the valve. <laughs> And if you compare with the a p p l e system, they got two spines. Sometimes、uh, it's very difficult, sometimes it will be challenging to negotiate across tortuous or a very acute angle of the、uh, descending aortic arch. Uh, and then uh, in the horizontal aorta,、uh, sometimes this flexibility actually allows us to deploy the valve at a more favorable, favorable angle. Than the、uh, F l u t system.、Uh, we we had very good experience of using this valve, and it is very stable. Once you open up the valve, once you decide on the height, then you just、uh, slowly open the valve. Keep it slow because there's no pressure drop. You can always take your time to, to、uh, slowly deploy the valve.、Uh, and unlike the F l u t F l u t has to deploy high up so that you will migrate, you, would, you will go down a little bit.、Uh, sometimes it's a little bit unpredictable. I would say this valve is very predictable and uh, can uh, have a very precise position at the end of the procedure, even for a more horizontal anatomy.、Mm. And, and I agree. I mean,、um, and also I think one important difference between the Evolute platform and, and the n a v i t o r is that the inflow portion is straight, it's cylindric, it's not tapered. And I think、uh, what you sometimes see with the Evolute valve is during the final deployment, it will go a little bit deeper. And I think also when people are saying, I've seen、uh, the Navitor valve and embolization to the aorta. I think it's because people compensate or compensate for, for the move down to the LV with、cool. the Evolut. So they try to be a little bit higher. So you have to be careful here. You have to make sure it's, as we saw very nicely demonstrated, take all the tension out, put the guide wire back,、uh, try to get the descending、uh, delivery system into the middle of the ascending aorta so there's no tension as you release, and then it's going to, to be in a very stable position as, as we just saw here. <coughs> Again, what is your key measures about the difference between these two platforms, Dr. Seitz? Because I know you have also a lot of experience with this,、mm. with both. Yes, but uh, uh, okay, uh, 
I think uh, for for Nabita, it's uh, you know the we don't need any uh, strong effect, mm -hmm. uh, strong effort. We don't need. It. Mm -hmm. But for uh, for Evolut, sometimes we need some uh, strong spirit to to decide mm -hmm. um, uh, whether the uh, the position is nice or not. And I have. Uh, uh, one question to Oli. Sure. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you have uh, a strong interest in, uh, you know, commission alignment of this system. So, do you have any uh, data? Uh, yes. Uh, in my hospital, so we did around 70 to 80 cases of Nabiter. So, uh, we try to figure out how sh uh, we uh, introduce the Navita system to achieve the uh, exact uh, commission alignment. So, so far, uh, we performed uh, uh, 0 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock uh, maneuver. But uh, <laughs> so far, uh, we don't have uh, uh, any good uh, angle to insert the Navita system. Maybe uh, Lars, uh, yeah. you, you have uh, data yeah, uh, about it, the After the, uh, during the next case, we're going mm. to talk a little bit about commercial alignment with this valve. And I'm not surprised when you're saying that, because up to now, uh, recently, uh, the stand frame was mounted uh, randomly on a delivery system. Mm. But now it's consistent, and what's recommended by the company is to have the flush port mm. 12 o'clock, so you look yes. straight down for it. So, so I think there's an explanation why you haven't seen any uh, good outcome because it was random how it was, but it's changed now. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, good. So uh, I think we have covered two important topics here, how to uh, avoid patient position mismatch, have a good durability of the valve, mitigate the risk of power valve leak, but also, Michael, coronary access uh, is also very important. So, so let's try to illustrate that on, on the next case. Let me just uh, present uh, my case first, and then we can have a little more discussion. Uh, it's an old lady, 88 years old lady, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She was known to have aortic stenosis, but with a recent uh, decrease in exercise tolerance, and then echo actually show a more severe aortic stenosis, mean gradient 53. Uh, I would say she's uh, in the sort of an intermediate risk group, but because of the uh, old age, uh, surgeons uh, turn her down and uh, asked us to perform uh, TAFI for her. Uh, BSA 1.5. Uh, I'll show you the coronary angiogram in a bit, but uh, uh, basically it's sort of a mild moderate disease in the mid LAD. And uh, we actually decided not to tackle the coronary stenosis before the TAFI procedure. These were the uh, CT findings. Uh, the perimeter is 68. Um, uh, with, uh, uh, I would say, quite adequate size of the sinus of, of our sulfur, quite calcified uh, annulus with some extension into the left ventricular alpha tract. And the coronary heights are uh, okay. The left is 16 and the right is 17. Uh, Access-wise, still uh, okay, uh, favorable for a TAFI procedure as you can see, although some calcium, but uh, it is of adequate size. So our plan is to do an adequate pre dilatation and then put in a 25 uh, Nebator, and if needed, we are going to do a post dilatation. We uh, usually we use a cerebral protection device for our TAFI procedure, so from the right radio, we will put in a Sentinel device, and then a uh, 14 French sheath exchange for a um, 14 French uh, FlexNav catheter, um, and this uh, uh, is the plan for our case. Maybe we can have a little discussion before I proceed on. Maybe, Michael, can you just take the next presentation up? Because uh, um, just to summarize, this is a patient who got pre-existing coronary artery disease. And, yes. And, um, and we can come back afterwards whether we should treat it or not. But I think one thing which is very important is to maintain access to the coronary arteries. Michael, can I ask you to open the next presentation? If oh, okay. You want this one? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think it was a little bit eye-opener for most of us to see uh, the re-access study, um, what the outcome was. Maybe you can explain uh, the study, Kentaro. Okay. So uh, this one? Yeah. Okay, so this is a re-access study, includes the 300 patients with 
depth coronary cannulation before and after TAVI. And unsuc unsuccessful patient was noted in 7.7% .7 of the patient, and the elbowed 19%, and 0.4% uh, of other, uh, maybe mainly Sapien device. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So, so actually out of those 23 patients where it was not possible to access the coronary arteries immediately after valve implantation, 22 was three with the Evolute platform. Uh, so it, it just tells us that we, we really need to, to pay attention when we implant this valve to preserve access. And, and that could be different things which can um, facilitate easy access. Of course, the bigger the stem cells are, the easier it will be to, to get it in. Um, it's different from platform to platform. And also, of course, uh, the height of the, the leaflets will also impact it. It will be easier to access coronary arteries if you have an intra-anal leaflet position than a super-anal leaflet position. But what everyone is talking about nowadays is that maybe the most important factor why it's not possible is that if you do not pay attention when you implant this valve, the valve is going to be orientated randomly in the aortic annulus. And you can end up in a situation here, like on the left-hand side, where you have this leaflet post positioned right in front of the coronary ostium. And again, if you have a high um, valve position, super leaflet position, that's going to make it difficult, or as you saw, in some cases, even impossible to, to access the coronary arteries. So I think today what everyone wants to do is to have an optimal outcome. We want to, to, to try to get what we call commercial alignment. So this transcatheter heart valve is rotated in exactly the same way as a native valve. It's the same way as the surgeon is doing it. It's going to facilitate easier access to the coronary arteries, and it may potentially also improve the durability of this valve if it if done it. So how to do it? There's been a few questions in the, in the, in the chat, uh, Dr. Saito, about how to obtain commercial alignment. We have seen that... Um, there's been a shift in what, how we implant these valves. Uh, we used to, to have a kind of a tricusp co-planner view, often with the C-arm in a LAO cranial projection. Now we, we move down to what we call a cusp overlap view, meaning that the C-arm will move towards an RAO caudal position. This is the position we can determine on the preprocedural CT scan where the left and the right cusp are overlapping. It was introduced to try to mitigate the risk of conduction abnormality and permanent pacemaker, and I think it also certainly have had an impact here. But it's actually also an, an ideal view to get commercial alignment, because as you see here on the left-hand side, if the two dots are overlapping, the red and the green, the left and the right cusp, you have the cusp overlap view, the commissure between those two cusps are going to point to the right of the floor screen. So the only thing you need to do here is to position one of the leaflet posts on the far right of your floral screen. And there will be landmarks um, on different valves. If you use the Evolute valve, uh, you have that C paddle, which should be positioned on the right-hand side of the screen. If you use the accurate valve, which is still not approved here, it, it got a free stent strut, very easy to identify. For the Navitor valve, you have to look here mid stent frame, you see the three leaflet posts, so one should be isolated on the right-hand side, and the two others should be overlapping on the left-hand side. If you can do that, you're going to have patient-specific commercial alignment. So not only about how to introduce the delivery system into the groin with the flush port in a certain orientation, but you can actually adjust it here before you start deployment. And of course, that's going to facilitate easier access to the coronary arteries. I'm just going to show you one more slide here because, uh, as I said, this COSPO lab view was not originally introduced to have commercial alignment. It was introduced to have a better understanding how deep, how high are you with your implant, and it's been shown with multiple platforms that it's actually going to decrease the risk of permanent pacemaker. This was a study we did here with about 200 patients treated with a traditional tree cusp co plan of view and 200 patients with a cusp overlap lab view, and you can see here for for the Navitor valve, portico valve, it actually did made a 50% reduction in the need for permanent pacemaker. So is that also the, the standard? What are you doing, Michael, for, for these patients and to try to optimize uh, access to the coronary arteries in, in the future? Right. Um, Lars, I, 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 I totally agree with your suggestion of uh, commercial alignment, but uh, it was in the early experience of our Navitor valve, so we don't have the 
concept of try to readjust after we don't uh, we find that it's not really aligned. So I'll show you what we, we have done. So uh, first of all, uh, we start with the coronary angiogram. You can see that uh, in the uh, mid LED, there was a sort of moderate disease. Oh, it's not playing. Okay, I have to pay again for you. So the moderate disease, I don't know any of you would try to fix this one before the TAFI procedure. For, so for us, we think it's just a mild moderate uh, LAD disease, so we just uh, uh, go ahead with the TAFI So, so maybe we can procedure. just pause here for a second, Michael, because yes, sure. uh, um, this has been a, a discussion from, from, from the beginning of TAFI. What about patients with pre-existing a significant but asymptomatic coronary artery disease. What, what is the status today? What, what should we do with those patients? Well, for, for me, uh, I always look at the uh, symptom of the patient and then the anatomy. So if the patient is symptomatic, I try to fix the coronary arteries before TAFI procedure. When there are a significant proximal stenosis, like prox especially proximal LED, I would try to fix it before TAFI procedure. For all other like for more distal lesions, a moderate disease, probably I will not do it until after TAFI procedure when the patient is more symptomatic, we can always go back and uh, perform the coronary interventional procedures as far as we can do the TAFI procedure right. Mm. So, so, so we have at least some evidence, uh, Kintara, about this from, from the activation study. Maybe you can just explain the audience what was the design of the study and, and what did it actually show Okay, the activation study uh, compares the, uh, so uh, they're going to fix the uh, coronary artery before TAPI or uh, they, they don't fix the coronary artery uh, before TAPI. And there was no significant difference in terms of the uh, mortality or clinical outcome. And based on that, so uh, our current practice is to leave the coronary artery disease as much as possible, uh, except for the patient with really high risk for hemodynamic collapse or a very severe lectomy disease. Because if we treat the patient before therapy procedure, we need to start the dual antiplatelet therapy and email leads to the higher bleeding risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's uh, at least what we saw from the activation. There's nothing to gain uh, for doing a routine revascularization of, of, of this patient, but it may uh, put the patient on a dual antiplatelet therapy and thereby increase the risk of, of mortality. But I think also if you're going to leave those lesions, we're not going to treat them. We, we certainly need to have access uh, afterwards, uh, after the type of procedure to the coroners. Sorry, Michael. Okay. So this was our uh, TAFI procedure. So as I mentioned, pre-dilatation with, uh, we, we like to use the true balloon, this uh, 20 millimeter true balloon, and then uh, 25 uh, Nevato valve. So um, the valve was uh, slowly deployed uh, without much uh, difficulty. And then uh, we think the um, valve frame is not adequately uh, expanded. So we uh, post-dilate with a 22 millimeter true balloon again. So this was uh, 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 what we got after the procedure. If you, uh, last you must have good eyes, you can see that in the cups of lab view, you see two taps here. One tap over this side. This is exactly the opposite what you have just mentioned. So unfortunately, we have a uh, um, valve uh, misalignment for this particular case, but there's nothing we can do at this moment. So uh, uh, we only hope that we can re-engage the coronary artery in the future. So I don't know whether you see the end of the procedure. So I think we got a good position of the uh, valve and then without much uh, regurgitation. So the story didn't really end here. Of course, um, the patient was discharged and then two months later, the patient came in with chest discomfort with dizziness. And you can see from this EKG that there was ST elevation over the anterior leads with a, a, a bump up of the troponin and echo evidence of depressed EF and also hypokinetic uh, LAD territory. So we have to go in and fix the uh, coronary artery. This was why it's not playing. Uh, sorry, i show you again. So this was the right coronary, we used a JL 3.5 and then JL 3. We usually downsize our guiding catheter when we engage coronary artery. Uh, 
uh, after the TAFI procedure. And you can see, uh, as I mentioned, even though we have um, misalignment of the device, but it's not difficult to engage the coronary artery. <clears throat> so you can see that we can have a very good image of the coronary arteries. So uh, although it's not uh, as bad as we thought, it's, it's uh, uh, not, I'll show you again. It's not really totally occluded, but there was a, a, a little more st uh, uh, stenosis over the mid part of the LAD, and actually we pass an uh, IFAS catheter, and uh, we see sort of a vulnerable plug at the mid LAD, and this was why we tried to fix it with the direct stenting of the mid uh, LAD with a 3-0 stand, and then post dilate with a 3-5 followed by a 4-0. So the vessel was actually a 4-0 vessel. And then the final IFAS. This was the final angiogram, as you can see, the LAD was much bigger than before. So because the patient came in with anterior STEMI, we have to fix this coronary artery. But uh, as you can see, it, even though the uh, valve is uh, misaligned, we can actually, uh, we don't really have uh, much difficulty in re-engaging this coronary artery, probably because of the lar larger cell size of the navital valve. Uh, uh, so that we can actually finish the coronary intervention without much difficulty. Mm. Thank you very much. So, so um, Dr. Said, so, um, it can be difficult to access the coronary arteries after a thyroid procedure. Um, any tips and tricks uh, to use um, non-standard catheter guide-wise or guideline for to, to do it? What, what is your practice if you, if you face difficulties? Of course, uh, I, I'm starting from uh, usually a uh, six-point guiding catheter, like uh, EBU or short uh, JL, JL short tip, JL 3.5 or even 3.0. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes, I'm taking a five French guiding catheter. It's more you know, controllable and, and also uh, for if I'm using a, a five French guiding catheters, I first cross the wire by floating technique to the coronary artery and then uh, give the uh, balloon catheter in, in, the, uh, in the coronary artery and uh, I'm uh, I'm pulling back the balloon, so then the guiding catheter is coming in, and then I'm taking a stand. Mm. That is my uh, te usual technique. Mm. So, Noriaki, do, do, do you, s I mean, you are working, uh, uh, all of us here, in, in, a, in a side doing TAVI procedure, and we know the design of the valves, and, but sometimes the patient will be admitted in the middle of the night uh, with acute uh, steamy in a non tavi site. Uh, what is it in Japan? Do you do anything to try to to teach uh, your colleagues uh, how these valves are designed? And, and as Dr. Saito said, here are some tips and tricks for how to engage the, the coronary arteries. Yes, Russ. Uh, in Japan, uh, this is a big topic uh, about uh, uh, STEMI after TAVI in non tabby center. Mm -hmm. So occasionally a patient after tabby uh, goes to a non tabby center uh, because of her acute coronary syndrome. Uh, that's why, so uh, in tabby center, uh, we should uh, give her education after, uh, and uh, chip and tricks uh, over PCI after tabby for non tabby center. This is uh, our uh, responsible um, as a tabby operator. Mm. And also, uh, my preference to select the guiding catheter uh, after tabby is a short chip catheter, such as a short uh, Jadkin's left and uh, JR is uh, I like. Mm. Mm. So, Masa, we, we just discussed whether to revascularize this patient before uh, tabby, but, but some patient will need revascularization. Mm. You'll be patient with. Uh, symptomatic coronary artery disease. So, will you do that before or after a tabby procedure? Yeah, and as Dr. Kentaro mentioned, and in my practice, I usually uh, leave the coronary artery disease before tabby, 
And uh, in especially the specific situation is a left main disease or a very significant dominant RCA disease should be treated before TAVI. But I would like to avoid the dual antiplatelet therapy during procedure, as he mentioned. And I'd like to ask Russ, please, and uh, you mean the, we need to deploy the Navita verb like this, two, two to one image. Is a commissioner attachment feature is two to one in the LAO view. And if the situation is two to one, how can we correct the rotate? How degree or how can I do to, to overcome mm. to misalignment and to avoid the misalignment of the verb? Yeah. Please teach us. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's at least two things which need to be fulfilled for all valves if you want to have commercial alignment. First of all, it needs to be possible to see where are the posts. Uh, and I think all the companies is now working to make very clear landmarks so you can see where on the stain frame are the posts uh, located when, when it's still loaded inside the capsule. Second thing is that it should be possible to talk the system, to try to rotate it. And I know that all the companies working with different solutions, some company will have a probably a knob at the end of the delivery system, so you can actually just turn that around and it's going to spin around so you have it. Mm. So I think it's still a little bit challenging with some of the platform because the developer was actually not designed. If you go two years back, very few people were talking about the commercial alignment. Mm. Now everyone is doing it. So, so companies are fully aware about that, so I think you're going to see a, a big move forward uh, to do this. Thank you. But, but again, back to the question here about patients who actually need to have a revascularization. Patient with a with a severe lesion again, would you treat that patient before or after Tavi Kentaro? Uh, so, uh, are, are we talking about this particular case? Not this case, but you know, that case patient have a su significant coronary lesion with angina. Okay, so actually, the uh, if the patient had the coronary uh, disease with angina, and the uh, severity of the aortic stenosis is not severe. Mm -hmm like the moderate to mild. Of course, uh, we treat the coronary artery first. And then, so uh, if the patient had the severe stenosis, it's quite difficult to differentiate uh, which disease is uh, the cause of the angina. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the patient have the left main disease or just proximal LAD disease, or if we have some concern about the future coronary access, we may treat the patient uh, uh, we, we may perform PCI before a type of procedure, but as far as we can, so we usually leave the coronary artery disease and we perform type of process. And then we re see, then then we reevaluate if the patient has angina or not. Mm. Good. Uh, uh, Lars, uh, if we want to reaccess the coronary arteries, uh, as in my case, uh, the uh, uh, the f the um, uh, leaflets are misaligned. So if we really come across such case, sometimes the guiding catheter is not going to engage very uh, nicely into the coronary arteries. As Dr. Saito has mentioned, you try to float the guide via in, but afterwards, sometimes you will use an extension catheter, which is very, which would be very helpful for for your cases. <coughs> extension catheters going in, and then you can do whatever mm. maneuvers you like. Um, and then uh, 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 for, for us, uh, we emphasize very much for the training of known TAFI operators mm -hmm. when they come across this sort of patients in their center, mm -hmm. where they don't know what uh, TAFI is, but they have to, to perform primary PCI for these patients. So we try to organize sort of training courses for them. Mm -hmm. We got the uh, heart rod, um, heart model in our lab. We put it really in our lab under X-ray, put in a Tafi device, and then try to ask the fellows and the uh, cardiologists from other hospitals, try to engage the coronary arteries. And they will have a feel how they are going to do it mm -hmm. when the device is aligned and when the device is misaligned. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, sort of a, 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 a simulation training for all the known Tafi operators. I think how, this is very How, how do you think about the, you know, we are giving a, a statin for all of the patients after TAVI to prevent uh, acute MI. <laughs> uh, you mean uh, do a coronary, coronary. study? Mm. No, not, this is not a study, but... Uh, Just routinely give them statin. Yeah. Oh, 
<laughs> well, right. We, 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 uh, these patients, a lot of these patients are already on statins anyway, right? <laughs> uh, I would say that's a good suggestion. Try to lower or control their risk factors for future coronary events. Yeah. Uh, especially when we move to younger patients. Because, because, because for your patients. case, if he had uh, statin already, maybe no. Maybe it won't happen, right? <laughs> But, but I think, I mean, uh, as we're going to treat more and more patients with TAVI and also younger and younger patients with TAVI, this, this is certainly becoming an issue. I think it's very important to, to educate about how to access the, uh, the coronary arteries afterwards. I, I'm just going to finish off here, just showing something uh, which uh, maybe not everyone is aware of, but if you ask a cardiac surgeon, he's full or she is fully aware, of, and that sometimes the coronary arteries is not taking off in the middle of the cusp, particularly from the right, you, you expect it to be here in the middle of the cusp, but sometimes you have what we call coronary osteal eccentricity, so the takeoff will be closer to the non-coronary cusp. And if you look into patients with tricuspid aortic valves, it's about 3% of the patient who got coronary osteal eccentricity. And if you look on patients who have a bicuspid aortic valve, it's around 7% of it. And that, of course, will also make it more difficult to access the coronary arteries after a TAVI. But also when you talk about commercial alignment, maybe you shouldn't have commercial alignment in these cases. So instead you should have, uh, try to have a, a coronary osteal overlap. So you see, I was saying before, if you have this cusp overlap you with the right and the left cusp overlapping, you should just have the leaflet post on the far right of the screen. But here you maybe should, from your pre-procedural CT scan, identify the C-arm angulation where you have the overlap of the two coronary arteries, and then you're going to have the post something like here. So you're going to have easier access to the coronary arteries. Of course, what you gain on the right coronary arteries, you're going to lose on the left. But I think it's better to have mild commercial misalignment for both than having a very severe for one of them. You can, of course, make a decision based on each patient. If the patient have a non-dominant right, you should maybe just forget about it and just focus on the left main. So it's just to say that it's a little bit more complex than we, we think because the coronary arteries are not always taking off where we expect them to, particularly in patients with bicuspid aortic valve. So Saito, uh, I think we come to an end. Maybe you will uh, summarize uh, uh, what we discussed uh, during the session here. Okay, uh, today we had a very nice three cases to demonstrate each issue in uh, Navita valve implantation. For the first case, uh, the uh, first case had uh, mitral valve mechanical replacement before, t 12 years ago. And then uh, the nicely uh, Navita valve was uh, placed in the, uh, in the very exact position and, uh, and without any pacing backup. And for the second case, uh, second case was a good example of PPM. And uh, by using a Navita valve, because of the uh, cylindrical, cylindrical uh, morphology and also the, uh, uh, the, the, the Navita valve showed the very good you know, reduction of PPM. No, actually no PPM for this particular patient. Maybe uh, this valve is very useful in the very small anilai uh, patient. And for the last case, uh, unfortunately, the patient developed acute myocardial infarction after uh, Navita valve implantation, but it was not related to the uh, Navita valve implantation itself. However, uh, and also the, by looking at uh, this case, you know, the, how, how uh, easily uh, we can cross the uh, uh, guiding catheter through the uh, stent strut of Navita, uh, you, you can understand. So the, uh, that, that is my su summary of this case, and uh, we have learned uh, many things, you know, how to, how to deploy the Navita valve, and, uh, uh, and also the, uh, if the analysis is small sized, uh, what kind of uh, uh, bulbs we have to take, and also the uh, 
sometimes we may have uh, uh, acute MI even after the uh, 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 valve implantation. And also the, uh, uh, we have to think that the, uh, uh, if the, there are two diseases, one is uh, coronary artery disease and another one is uh, aortic stenosis, uh, usually we start to treat this patient by placing the, the uh, uh, tabi valve. And then we are, if necessary, we are going to the uh, PCI for this patient. Because if we start from the PCI, uh, there is, should be a, a very difficult uh, issues for uh, DAPT. So this is a usual sequence of the treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much for everybody. Very nice speakers here. I learned uh, very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I want to close.